Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Dark Souls 3 Lore Through. <clears throat> Just got on the road of sacrifices. Um, and yeah, the only thing that I forgot to read, I believe, is the Sigbrow. Huh. Oh, and some of these <coughs> charcoal pine resins. I just put all this stuff into my uh, inventory. Why did it... Let's see... I literally just put this in. Um... Did all... Okay, yeah, so all these stayed. Hmm. Okay, whatever. <clears throat> so let's read the seed brow. Um, special brew of Sigvard of Katarina, perfect for travel in its jolly barrel mug. Restores HP and temporarily boosts frost. Leave it to Sigvard to discover a drink that even an undead can enjoy. Perhaps his long years spent undead have left him wanting to drain a cup or two and revel as if he were still among the living. <clears throat> Must be extremely alcoholic then. I don't know. I, I guess I wouldn't know what if undead don't drink or don't enjoy drinking or whatever. Like, I guess it restores HP, so maybe it's similar to Estus. It looks like it might be similar to Estus. You can see it kind of coming through the barrel. And then we just have stuff here, which I didn't read this officially. I thought we had already had it, but used in the undead settlement to preserve undead bodies after dissection and to bury them. So... Um, makes sense. <laughs> we were finding it in the undead settlement. Um, and then this one. Normally used in the undead settlement for preservation and burials, but can mature into this state, becoming a valuable substance used in a certain ceremony. Often seen for trade at exorbitant prices. So we read that before, but I, <clears throat> I just wanted to talk about how the ones we find in the undead settlement are talking about the undead settlement, which is nice. Anyway, let's continue on. So now we see these guys, and these guys are the Corbians. And they are obviously, well not obviously, I guess, but these are crow people and therefore probably associated with Velka in some way. And they're morphing into crow people. Like they aren't crow, they're a little bit furry, but they aren't immediately crow people. Yeah, you can see like the wings on there. We get a Shriving Stone. A gem of Infused Titanite. Has the benefit of undoing... Yeah, so this just... No lore. You can just de-infuse with that. <clears throat> Alright. I don't know what they drop, if anything. Something down there. Yeah. Can't see anything. Um, and yeah, there's more of these carts. Because, you know, as we kind of talked about earlier, this is where they kind of rounded people up. Were these Corvians on? These guys can be pretty nasty. And there's this sorcerer caster. And he can cast a poison. Were these Corvians on these upset carts? Oh, 
Or were they the ones carting them through <clears throat> to the road of sacrifices? Um, are these the guys that we, you know, whenever we rolled into, they like staggered in the undead settlement? And now they're like turning into crows or... actually don't know. I just know that they're similar to the crow people and that they're called Corvians. <clears throat> I did burn my sublime bone dust. We have the brigand axe and looks like we have Mildred the man-eater. Well, or something. It's kind of a cool weapon. Ooh, that really staggered me. Yeah, you can buff it like that temporarily to <clears throat> very quickly uh, give you a, like a buff on your weapon. It also gives you health every time. You hit or kill? Hit. Axe favored by brigands of a distant land. Surprisingly sturdy battle axe that requires more strength to wield than standard axe. And it's a war cry. <clears throat> Butcher's knife with an oddly with an oddly large blade wielded by the mad woman hunting the road of sacrifices. Back in the undead settlement, the woman acquired a taste for human flesh, of which she took glee in partaking. Skill of sharpen, sharpening the blade increases HP restored with each successful hit. Yeah, so, okay. So, it, it restores HP with each successful hit, but it restores more when you, when you buff it. So, yeah, I was saying that there was a lot of things that reminded me of the depths in, I guess, in the High Wall of Lothric, but also in the Undead Settlement. And I guess Mildred, or <clears throat> the Mad Woman, maybe she was a mound maker, um, she through the practices of there, uh, got a taste for human remains. Now we have the brigand set. Oops, it's probably easier to do this. Who had from a foreign land, probably belonged to a brigand, who met his match. Foreign lands undead were banished to send a message to populace, and then, and when the message was not heard, they banished the living too. It's a very, <clears throat> I guess it's the most explicit um, kind of description of stuff we've been talking about in Dark Souls 1 and 2 about how, and it, they talk about it really well in Bloodborne as well, but we haven't played that yet. Um, that, you know, they, they carted up the undead like they were scared of them. And that when people didn't act, that, that that was their their way that they exerted their power over their people. But when they didn't take that power, they're like, well, we'll just lock up humans too. Like, that's the most explicit form of that, I feel, in the games. Brigand Twin Draggers. These paired daggers are preferred weapons of the brigands of, the dis of a distant land. When two-handed, the wielder holds a blade in each hand, allowing for divergent attacks that include left-handed moves. And it's the quick step, because they're daggers. Alright. Uh, so that's moving forward. They are using a Corvian blade as well. Oh, I'm so close to being able to upgrade this weapon again. One more. So 
that's how you can get back up. <clears throat> and, no. Okay. And you can drop down here, I think. I'll just take these guys out. Oh, nice. I think my cat can sense when I'm recording. And he's like, I'm just gonna walk in and make a lot of noise. Nice and ember. Alright. Now that we killed those guys, okay, yeah. So there's either a ladder or a way to drop down here. Treasure ahead, okay. Okay, looks like some dogs. Um, there's actually, like, a pregnant dog here, or something, or some, a dog with bloated, this one right here has a distended belly of some sort. I don't know if that means anything. But that one doesn't, and this one does. It does look like it's attached, but that could be a model issue that they just use the same model and then attach something to that specific one. Braille Divine Tome of Kareem. <clears throat> well, there's an object. A sacred Braille Tome from Kareem filled with advanced miracles. Give it to a storyteller to learn advanced Kareem miracles. In the way of white, there is a tradition of placing great faith in the words of the blind, and Braille Tomes are not unusual. So did the way of white spread to Kareem then? Is that what we're trying to say? Was it always there? I mean, is it is it was it everywhere? I don't know. But the uh, way of white loves to put great faith in the words of the blind, and braille tones are not unusual. So, and maybe that's because people try to create fire keepers, make them blind. Morn's ring. Well, we learned about Morn. Well, we didn't learn about Morn, but we heard about Morn, who was the apostle to the archbishop. Um, a malformed ring given to Knights of Kareem. Morn served the goddess Kaitha and later became an apostle of the archbishop. They labored together to provide comfort to the suffering. So it looks like Kaitha's being... Um, that is interesting because the red tear stone ring comes from Kareem, and that is associated with the god Kaitha. The blue tear stone ring is also associated with Kaitha, but that's from Katarina in the original game. But Morn's ring. So apparently, so there's an archbishop in Kareem, of which there are knights. And it looks like... I don't remember, what was the object that we read about? What was the object that we read about uh, Morn from? Can't recall. Alright. Good, good, we're doing great on time. So yeah, there's the uh, the broken bridge. There's the dragon. Oops. If there's the dragon. This is where we got dropped off from after fighting Vort, and then the undead settlement would be over there, and that's the high wall of Lothric.
Oh. I just, I have notes that I make every, uh, episode. Um. So, I, I, do, I do want to mention that I leveled up Int to 10 for something that will happen in this or next episode. Um, I just used a bunch of souls that I had and uh, did that because I need to do an int check with the uh, character. But anyway, here's some people here. So this is uh, on... Oops, I guess I shouldn't say it. But anyway, this character is uh, wearing the same Elite Knight set as uh, Oscar, and obviously that we can find in the in the first game. And this guy is wearing kind of a different. He's got a tattered cape. It almost looks like the Gimp from Pulp Fiction. The way that mask like covers his whole face. It's kind of creepy. Oh hello, how do you do? I am Anri of Astora, unkindled like you. This is Horace, a friend and traveling companion. And you too in search of the Lords of Cinder. Mm -hmm. We are well along the road of sacrifices. Below us is the crucifixion woods. Beyond the flooded woods lies Farron Keep, home of the undead legion. Further yet is the Cathedral of the Deep. Oh, that's interesting. We seek the cathedral, home of the grim Aldrich. Mm -hmm. We may go our separate ways now, but we are both seekers of lords. The next time we cross paths, one may find the other in a time of need. May the flames guide your way. I don't know if that's a developer thing or just a, you know, whatever thing, but she says that the fair and keep and then lies the cathedral of the deep, but that's not true. Those are branching paths, so. Um... So this is Horus, and they seek uh, Aldrich, and they're going to the Cathedral of the Deep, which is what where we're going right now, as well. Oh yes, Horus. He's not very talkative. But don't think ill of him. He's an upstanding, kind-hearted knight, a fine partner for this grueling journey. Without his help, I would have cursed this onerous duty long ago. We are well along the road of sacrifices. Beyond the flooded woods lies Farron Keep, home of the undead leaves. We may go our separate with the next okay. time. Made of so you're a man of few words. What do you have to say? <laughs> hmm. All right. So he gave us the Blue Sentinels, which has an emblem of like a... Um, a sword over like a wa waxing or waning moon. Faded sheepskin parchment depicting the dark moon and a sword. Equipped to pledge oneself to Blue Sentinel's Covenant. When a member of the Way of Blue is threatened by a dark spirit, the Blue Sentinels, in compliance with the Ancient Accord, assume the form of Blue Spirits and help the, to root out the invader. Summoning takes place <coughs> automatically, automatically while this is equipped. By the way, I'm going to change to my Sunlight Covenant. Um, we are well along the field of the Um, So it's interesting because it doesn't look like the Blades of the Dark Moon are in this game. They, they went with the Blue Sentinels. But I guess that might make sense just because... You know, the Blades of the Dark Moon were very heavily associated with Gwendolyn, and unless Gwendolyn makes an appearance in this game, I don't know. But they also kind of were associated with, uh, you know, Velka. I mean, not under that name, but <clears throat> before Gwendolyn took over, Velka kind of ran that covenant.
Hmm. You're an unkindled, aren't you? I am Cirrus of the Sunless Realms, former servant of the Divinity. Duties we each bear, but one's duty is a solitary affair. I doubt we've much to gain from fraternization. Blessing of the moon upon your journey. The Sunless Realm. Blessing of the moon upon your journey. I doubt we've much to blessing of the moon upon your journey. Maybe there is... Maybe there is a dark moon presence in this game. Interesting. All right. Well, they've gone on ahead without me. So yeah, um, we have to snuff out those three uh, secret ahead. Yeah, okay. That's literally the path you can just walk on. Um, we have to snuff out those three flames in the Farron Keep. And we can actually see the three flames right there. As we could from up on the high wall of Lothric. Um, these are an interesting family. I wish you could get this weapon. Oh, that was interesting. Like, I wish you could just get a big branch, but you can't, as far as I'm aware, and I've never seen anyone use it. Figured that would be a, a huge PvP thing. Um, I'm gonna go this way first, um, but we're gonna definitely explore We're going to explore everything else. This is called Crucifixion Woods, and we can see these circular kind of cross things. Those will be important to remember. For something much later on, but you can see yeah, on his back. It kind of looks like a, like a dagger. I'm thinking the dagger of a, from a ribbon. Also, kind of looks like half moons sometimes. Dark Souls 3 is all about spacing, I feel. Because, like, the enemies... I mean, it's. I think it's interesting, you know? At this point, I don't think I prefer it. But, like, what is interesting is that, like, Dark Souls 1 was all about parrying. And, uh... Well, not... not I mean, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> but I guess... What makes the game trivialized is parrying in any type of critical attack. You know, Dark Souls tool kind of built on that, but it has such a different, um, like, it has such a different mechanic that, like, you know, everything's so slow. And so it just, it you, you rely on kind of, like, taking your time with everything. But Dark Souls 3 is really about good proper placement. And then you can take on people. I'm gonna attempt to... So here's a Black Knight, by the way, which is kind of weird. Oops, I tried to back dodge. Okay, nice. I don't know how many times I can do that. I assume he turns around right away. Oh, oops. That's the one I hate. Okay, we 
might be able to get him with. There we go. Drops nothing. But he's guarding something. That's good and valuable. So we get the cell sword set. Uh, I need this one. Metal helm interwoven with coarse cloth, able to endure hardships of battle and prolonged travel. It is light considering the build, striking a fine balance between absorption and substance. Oh, okay. That one's a little different description, but the same content. And then the cell sword twin blades on a corpse. So I guess that guy lost his clothes and then fell down here. I don't know. Um, paired scimitars used by certain cell swords. The scimitars' blades, uh, sharp blades, make for effective slashing attacks, but fare poorly against metal armor and tough scale covered hides. With a scimitar in each hand, the wielder can vary their onslaught with unique left handed attacks when in the proper stance. And it is a spin slash. Here's a big item, and it's sitting on someone's head. Is the Farron coal, and we could have come by this other way and peered through here and seen this, but I just wanted to come and grab this right away. Coal used for weapon infusion, long ago used to forge the great swords of the undead legion of Farron. Give to the blacksmith in the shrine to allow the use of gems for heavy, sharp, and poison infusions. Okay. I guess we'll probably, um... probably get to the next bonfire and then we'll have to call it for an episode. I think this is a Titanite shard. Glad he missed me. <laughs> good. Good, 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 good. These little crabs, and then there's these big crabs. skip at that time. And we get the Great Swamp Ring. I don't think these guys hurt all that much, but... Okay. Boost Pyromancies. Ring said to be chiseled from the bone of the flame salamander by blighted pyromancers living in the Great Swamp. Boost Pyromancies. It is believed that salamanders are the descendants of demons born from a chaos flame, from which pyromancy is also said to have originated. That's interesting, because when we saw the flame salamanders in Dark Souls 2 in the Force of Fallen Giants, when we killed them, the flames from the depths, like, disappeared. So they definitely had some sort of, like, connection to that. And so now we have the tattered stuff and the great swamp pyromancy tome. And we are invaded by um, 
I'm just gonna get out of this. Okay. Oops. This is a, an NPC. But yeah, she... Now it says Yellow Finger. I wonder if it's related to Ring Finger Leonard. This is Yellow Finger Hazel. Come out of this so we can actually fight. She's using the Farron. Interesting. Dressed kind of like the Xanthus, but she's using pyromancy. Er, not pyromancy. Using sorcery. Ugh. This is not going to be good. Kill this guy. Okay, good. Oh, I just get it automatically. That's good. Alright, so this is a guy, this is like the Forest Covenant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just get off me. I thought I was offline, actually, too. So I hope this doesn't kind of pervade the, the experience here. Alright, but we got some things here. What did we get? Anything here? No. Well, we got the uh, Great Swamp Pyromancy Tome. Pyromancy Tome from the Great Swamp containing advanced pyromancies. Give to the old master pyromancer to learn advanced pyromancy. Spells of the Great Swamp are passed down from master to pupil. Without a master, there is no pupil. But without a pupil, there's also no master. Exactly. Choice weapon of yellow finger Heisel, a finger of Rosaria and Xanthus Scholar. This is both a weapon and a sorcery staff. The gold specks are remnants of lost sorceries. And he uses steady chant. So we now know ring finger and yellow finger, and this is the first time we've heard finger of Rosaria. We know about Rosaria, but um now we know that there are fingers of Rosaria. There's a yellow finger and a ring finger. Crown supposedly made an imitation of a divine creature of Ulisil mushroom. Land of ancient golden sorceries, or ones where they manipulate light. Xanthus clothing is the mark of a researcher of lost sorceries, and the oversized crown is emblematic of their work. Such a curious pursuit is surely nothing to be ashamed of. Well, I thought Xanthus was related to pyromancy. Let's continue with our onslaught of this area.
many of these guys. Are these guys from Dark Souls 2 only? They're in the, uh... In the, uh... What is that called? I can't recall. The Carvis Valley? And, and, and above? Twin Dragon Great Shield. The lightest of all great shields, made from wood and decorated with a two-headed dragon. Great shields are the largest type of shield and offer both high stability and damage absorption. And it's a shield bash. Okay. Just gonna get rid of these guys so we can actually crab stuff. I think the all the crabs like reappear, so it kills its own kind, eh? Just back up. We still got two more of you to fight. Grass crash shield, oh that's nice. Is there Yeah. That sucks. Okay, well, I'm not trying to fight two of these guys at once. Okay, one's gone away. I guess I'll just have to take them out one at a time. close to being dead. <sighs> okay. So unnecessary, but... There's one where you can, like, get out of it by struggling. Okay, so that one doesn't drop anything. Old medium metal shield of unknown origin. The grass crest is slightly imbued with magic, which slightly speeds stamina recovery, and you can parry with it. All right. Well, let's take on the last guy here. Although well, we're just gonna have to do this again. Where's the... Where's the last, uh... I thought there was another, uh... I thought there was three huge crabs. Fallen Knight. Garb. I don't want to trigger these guys yet. Um... Uh, I think the tome's the only thing there. Okay, so I think we're good to kind of go up to the bonfire here and explore this area back here, and then we can explore. Okay, yeah, let's...
Okay, I think I got everything over there. Trigger that so it'll spawn there if I die. Boys. the shard another ember There's some here too. I missed that. Alright. Got a little bit of time left. Oops. <laughs> oh, it didn't do any damage. That made me nervous. <laughs> Oh yeah, so we have the Sage, we have the Fallen Knight stuff as well. And the Sorcerer stuff. So let us go and I guess I'm gonna, I'll end the episode reading all this stuff and then we can continue here where we left off. Or we can avoid the crabs. more. Oh, just that guy. Whatever. He's fine. Alright. So let's reset everything. Um, alright. So, let's see. I think that's just the crab. Uh, well, let's look at all the stuff that we found here. So, we found the Fallen Knight, helm of an order of fallen knights who disbanded and fled, but ultimately, but met ultimate, <laughs> but met untimely deaths. The drab tattered hood conceals tough black metal, which provides dependable protection from fire. It is just possible to make out the majestic gold engravings on its surface. That's pretty cool, actually. Tire of a sorcerer from the Vinheim Dragon School. A simple hood worn inside the robes. Represents those who have outgrown the academy, abandoning formal headwear and distancing themselves in order to continue their research in solitude. Attire of traveling conjurators. Conjurators were the predecessors to pyromancers and spent their lives roaming the lands. No wonder their attire was designed to protect them from fire, poison, and other threats of nature. It's interesting because it, it's kind of saying they're pre- the predecessors to pyromancers, but yet in the other games, the tattered robes were the pyromancer garb. So it's interesting that maybe over time, they kind of got a different association, maybe because, you know, pyromancy is so much different now. Um, okay, underneath the deep blue sorcerer's coat, conventional uniform of the academy. OK, 
Okay, same. Black dyed leather gloves embellished with silver medallions. And gun, yep, same description. Oops. Um, let's see. Held beneath leather boots, drab, yep. Oops, I'm pressing that, not that. Sorcerer knows that long-term research means a lengthy and arduous road ahead. I like how uh, research implies that you have to travel <laughs> in that sense. Okay, well that should be good for now. Um, thanks for watching, and uh, join me for the next episode where we take on the... Uh, I don't know what the area you would call it, but we take on the crystal uh, wizard. All right. Bye.